Ron Whitcomb is a legend in the PGA simply because of his integrity and passion. The legacy of leaders comes down to sometimes just a visceral reaction, a feeling that people have about the person. And uh, Brian was universally respected and admired. Brian Whitcomb in my life, I, I can't imagine it without him. Um, next to my dad, the, the most influential, empowering human being that God has ever put in my life. Brian Whitcomb's golf journey had a significant influence on the game from the outset. Brian um, built his own golf courses um, from the ground up, and there's nothing he wouldn't do from plowing the dirt and going out and setting the holes. And I think that's a great leader. There's nothing he would ask someone to do that he wouldn't do himself. Brian's passion and uh, his vision for the 500 Club was just access to the facility for everybody. There's been numerous children and young adults that have come through the 500 Club that didn't necessarily have the means to play the game, and he made sure that we took care of them day in and day out if they needed to hit range balls or play golf, all on his own dime, uh, just to make sure that they had the experience that he wanted them to have. If it weren't for him, I don't know where I would be with golf, just letting me use this facility at his course, the 500 Club in Glendale, Arizona. Like, uh, who knows where I'd be? Could have maybe stopped playing the game, but it was that motivation he gave me to just keep saying, "Come out and be able to play here." We've seen kids as three and four year olds go through the program, wind up going and playing high school golf, wind up playing collegiate golf, and some of them even getting in the PGA program and becoming Class A members. Brian's path would eventually lead him to the service of all PGA members as he went through various stages of governance. First in the section, then national, culminating in being elected as a national officer of the PGA of America. I give you the 35th president of the PGA of America, Mr. Brian Whitcomb. Brian's legacy as president and as an officer of the PGA, I think will long live as being a PGA president that really focused on all PGA members. What he did in the connection of bringing the PJ of America to the rank and file member, making sure that we attended section meetings, making sure they had a special occasion, opening an officer, and they, we were there, we were present, we were visible, and they got to, to ask us the questions, to ask us the hard uh, issues that they wanted to know about, we got to do that. But Brian sort of started those town halls where he would go out to every section all the time and talk directly to the member. He spent most of his time as an officer connecting with as many members as he possibly could. He's a cheerleader for all of us PGA members. Um, he, he planted the seeds of, of just being accessible, being involved with things, growing the game of golf. One of the things I learned most from him was that you know, need to be able to reach out to our members and let them know that we care. That first of all, we're one of them. We're just like them. We may be an officer, but we're one of them. And, and to, to let them know how much we care. Perhaps the most impactful example of how much Brian cared for PGA members came in 2005 during the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Katrina was such a landscape changing and world changing, a life changing uh, event for all the professionals and, and everybody on the Gulf Coast. I don't think anybody who knew Brian Wicker was surprised by the fact that he personally went down to the Gulf States after Katrina to New Orleans to try to reach out and help PGA members. That's just who he was. There was just a calling inside of me that said, uh, you don't have anything but a handshake and well wishes. And uh, but I went from you know, course to course, just looking for a member that I could say we care. But a lot of these professionals I've talked afterwards about just how much it meant to them to know that somebody from the national office and a national officer would take his time just to come and see them, shake their hand, and talk to them, and make sure they were going to be okay. Brian felt like one of us when he did that. He, he, really endeared himself to the Gulf States when he did that. 
In 2007, Dan Rooney was another of the thousands of PGA members that Brian took the time to listen to. We're very proud of Patriot Golf Day in the Bowl of Mark. We have given out over $185 million worth of scholarships. That's over 35,000 scholarships. Brian was so instrumental in helping the PGA of America and the Bulls develop a great relationship, help with the marketing promotion, explain to our professionals the value uh, of supporting a great mission like this. And without Brian Whitcomb, Folds of Honor does not exist. The 35,000 lives that have been changed never happens. When Brian was running for secretary, and uh, we had a, a, a new property down at um, Port St. Lucie in Florida. And um, he personally got down there and got on a bulldozer and moved dirt to create a teaching area for PJ members because um, it was needed, he knew how to do it, and he wanted to help. And that was the kind of um, can-do attitude that he had. Brian also took an interest in another PJ member of the property, when it came time to consider upgrades to Valhalla Golf Club prior to the 2008 Ryder Cup. Brian, better than anyone, because he owned two golf courses he built himself uh, and built others. He understood the needs at Valhalla, but he also had a practical side that he'd look at it and go, there's no way I would spend this much money to do it, and would try and help them find ways to do it, to navigate to get the best value for the PGA of America to both improve the asset, but also not to just spend money unnecessarily. Uh, and he spent a great deal of time there personally. We caused thousands of trees to be taken out in Valhalla to create viewing corridors. And what they did, they opened up the golf course and the crowds came and the roars were unbelievable. From Brian's standpoint, Obviously, all of us wanted to win. We were all were proud of it. But it, it, you could see in his eyes, and you could see in the emotional reaction he had to the, the victory, how meaningful it was to him, and how um, proud he was as president to be involved with the Ryder Cup and see that victory. It's my honor to present the captain of the United States team, Paul Isinger, with the Ryder Cup. After working alongside U.S. Ryder Cup captain Paul Isinger, Brian took the lessons learned from that experience to help him succeed in his captaincy of two teams that also represented the United States. In 2009, Brian guided the US PGA Cup team to its first ever victory on Scottish soil, then turned his attention to the future of the game. The Junior Ryder Cup team, which I was fortunate enough to captain in 2014, for me was the best event that I've ever been part of. He did so much research on the kids and spent we spent a lot of time with the with our team and we did a lot of team building where he listened to everyone. He's a great listener. Obviously Brian did a great job. Um, I feel like he kind of just led us um, just come together as a team and then try to force it really, just kind of let it happen. And I think that's one of the reasons we played so well. As talented the golfers as they were, they were better human beings. And it gave me all the faith and all the hope uh, that the games will be in good hands in the future. Indeed, the game has always been in good hands with Brian Whitcomb, who continues to inspire to this day. Every round of golf is a good round of golf. This disease obviously was a big shock to everybody, um, obviously especially himself. He uh, quickly was unable to do what he did on a daily basis. Definitely doesn't let it define him. You know, he's doing well with it. He's active. Throw the keys. Here you are. Don't be late tomorrow morning. He's just confined to that chair, but his mind still works. So as long as his mind works, a physical problem is not going to slow him down one way or another. I didn't think he could get more inspiring to me 
but the way he has fought that battle um, is so inspirational and just shows truly what a, you know a hero Brian Whitcomb is. Thanks for the sunrise. Thanks for the night sky. Thanks for the deepest blue in my daughter's eye. I've never seen him mad or you know sad. He just always makes the best out of everything and keep your chin up, he says. And, you know, move forward. He is my hero. He um, he's taught me everything I know about life. Brian touched so many people's lives. And you know, we, when you have 28,000 men and women professionals in the entire country, there's always somebody that needs help. And it, whether it's a phone call or a letter or a handwritten note or a flight across the country, he was there to help. And I think that's what made him legend. He's looked up to by so many PGA members. His legacy is, is going to be his passion, his accessibility, and being who he is, Brian Whitcomb. I mean, he is a legend in the PGA of America. this man did for two years working for us. Fantastic. Thank you. You represented us beautifully. And I'm very proud to be a PGA member uh, as you were leading us. Thank you. Uh, I'll take just a moment and I hope you'll indulge me. I, uh, my wife Stephanie and, I, uh, Stephanie and I were unable to attend the services of Pat Riley. And, uh, we always felt badly about that. I couldn't do anything about it, but um, obviously sent cards, did what we could. But I, I think Sue is here, his lovely wife Sue is here with us. And uh, I just want to say to the Riley family, to Sue, uh, we love you, uh, we love Pat. Um, he was a mentor of mine, he was my coach. Uh, he's a guy that could put his arm around you or kick you in the butt, it didn't, he never knew what. But he was a patriot, he was a gentleman, and he was our friend. So Sue and the Riley family, thank you for lending him to us. Thank you so much. Well, Brian, I, as you stated, uh, there's been a few events you maybe haven't been to in recent years. So how, how does it feel back? How does it feel to be back at an annual meeting with so many of your PJ family? Thank you. Um, uh, gosh, you're exactly right. I, uh, I've been wrestling with multiple sclerosis, and uh, it, it's you know it's it's fighting a hard battle, but I'm trying. Um, but but because of that, I've been I'm unable to attend meetings for I don't know eight, about eight years now, and be back in the Southwest section, my section, as well as my fondness and my I'm a member of the Pacific Northwest section also. But to see Shu and Joe and Murph and Al and 
Jay and all the section members has been a real privilege for me and an exciting week and I'll remember this week forever. Uh, turning to the national side uh, to see my fellow past presidents and the national PGA staff is so heartwarming for me and I just these gentlemen taught me about everything I know and I'm forever grateful for them and it's just been a wonderful week and then if I could just as importantly just as importantly it's the part of the delegation I haven't had the privilege and I'll say it again the privilege of meeting all of you because today we look backwards for a few minutes and it's, it's enjoyable and it should be done periodically but when this is over we need to turn around and turn our eyes forward and look to the future and we're relying on all of you as leaders and I have all the confidence in the world of your future leadership and I can't wait to see where you take us in the sphere of golf and I thank you so much for taking the time and, uh, and away from your family to give your service to the association, to the game, and to us members. Thank you so much. I look forward to the ride. Thank you. Ryan, there was a lot of people obviously that you served with and that you've really influenced on the videos. Two pretty special videos, people talking about you and your service. Anything in particular there bring back a memory or street? Oh my gosh. Kind of struck a chord with you? Oh my gosh, it 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 as you, it's, it hits like a brick for me. I it just everything floods back so quickly. Uh, um, my greatest experience I think uh, on the golf side was the junior rider cup when I was the captain. Uh, I saw twelve ridiculously talented individuals, six boys, six girls. And our job with Mary B. Porter King and Alan Ronowski as my uh, uh, assistants, our job was simply to take these ridiculously talented individuals that were sort of in a silo, because golf can put you in a silo if you're not careful. And my job was to break the silos away. And we did, and meld them into one team. And like I said in the video, these kids were better people than they were golfers, and they're the best young players in the world. So. Uh, I just am thrilled to have the opportunity to, to captain that team. It was uh, special for me. Um, moving on, I, uh, my time at Katrina was uh, eye-opening to say the least. I saw things that uh, no camera can capture. Uh, I, saw, uh, uh, I saw a professional with, uh, you know that look of forlorn when you're worn out and you just don't know which way to turn. If you'll let me, I'll tell you a 30 second story. Uh, uh, Mr. Lights was uh, in Slidell. Uh, he, all of, his, all of his maintenance crew had left him because FEMA was paying $35 an hour to hang drywall or do other activities in New Orleans after the flood. So he has no maintenance crew. He has no power. The pump station doesn't work. Uh, he's got a 200 gallon spray rig. Picture this a 200 gallon spray rig that he'd go out and water his greens trying to keep them alive. And I saw a look of despair and a look of hope also and determination and a no quit attitude that would make every American very, very proud uh, to see uh, Greg Mr. Lights doing that. So uh, that, that was a thrill. And I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the folds of honor and uh, probably the most inspirational man I've ever met, that's Lieutenant Colonel Dan Rooney, and um, he, uh, it's like a magnet, he, uh, he called me and I called him back, and gosh, we, I couldn't say no, he asked me to go to a fundraiser in, in Michigan, and I did, and uh, Folds of Honor was born, and uh, Patriot Golf Day was started that year, and imagine what had to happen. So 2007, we're gonna start Patriot Golf Day. We only had about six weeks to do it, and uh, to activate this. And the uh, championship, our PGA championship at Southern Hills in Tulsa. Dan's a, of course, in the Oklahoma Air National Guard at that time. He's uh, got CBS Sports behind us. We have David Faraday, we got Jim Nance. It was just this wonderful, well, I think Dan called it synchronicity, uh, where, where things collide. And it was absolutely wonderful. And it gave us a chance. And the first year, of Patriot Golf Day, thanks to all of you. We did $1.3 million, and we thought we hit it out of the park. We thought we had the longest home run ever hit. 
Well, here we are a couple hundred million dollars later and uh, the Foles has just launched. And can I just say, it's the purest mission I've ever seen. We're in a gold standard category where, I, uh, where 90 cents of every dollar that somebody contributes goes to scholarships. And we're very, very proud of that. I still proudly sit on the, the Folds of Honor board. And, uh, it's, it's been phenomenal. So those are a couple, a couple. So Brian, what is it though, right? I mean, what spoke to you? Essentially, you just determined it was the right thing to do, to get on a plane, to go to Katrina, with everything you had going on as president, or an idea from Dan to support the families of veterans. Like, what was it in you that just said, I need to do this? Uh, I'll be honest, Roger Warren said it beautifully. There was something, I have no idea, no words, nobody, just something in your heart. Uh, I know you, you live it. Uh, there's something in your heart that just draws you uh, to certain activities. And just something just emotionally pulled me to New Orleans and, and, and Katrina. As you know, I, I live up in Arizona and Oregon at the time. I'm a long ways from there, but I just felt this calling and I wanted to give what I could. So I called Chris Wood, who was our liaison at the PGA for, uh, for the officers, and asked her for some uh, money clips, no money in it, money clips, and uh, some pins, PGA logo pins. And I took off and I got there at the airport. I think it was only a flight or two coming in. Uh, the hotel was all boarded up except for a couple floors. There was no food service or anything like that. And I just, uh, the Gulf States gave me a map, if you will, of, of golf courses. And I, I just, for lack of a better word, aimlessly drove around and just shook hands and tried to be a good listener and uh, looked him in the eye and just tried to give what little hope I could. But I can tell you, uh, just like the aftermath of this, of our latest hurricane, no picture can capture uh, the devastation uh, that, that we saw uh, down there. So uh, there's a lot of work to be done. There's still work to be done. Well, Brian, on the videos, as well as countless members have always described you as being member first and always having the member in the forefront. Um, I remember back in 2006, you were involved with properties. We showed some of those in the video about you jumping on equipment and helping at that time, you actually hired me to be the Senior Director of Golf Properties, and I came to work for the PJ for a short period of time. There was a lot of things going on. You were renovating two golf courses there, renovating the golf course in Valhalla. So there was a ton of work that the position I just got hired for was responsible for in doing a bunch of activity. And seven months later, I left that position for an opportunity to work at Whistling Straits of Black and Front and Kohler, and I was very, very, afraid and worried about making that call to Brian to tell him he had hired me for a position that he thought I could help and I was leaving. And the first thing he said to me was congratulations. Anything I can do to help you in the new position, I'm here for you. There's just not many people, not many bosses that would take that attitude. But you did that to hundreds and thousands of PJ members. You are always about the member first. People described you that way. Thank you. I, uh, you know, as an employer, uh, so I always thought to myself, if somebody left, as long as it was on an upward trajectory, help them do everything you can for them. The ones that hurt the most were lateral movements or when an employee would leave and in our opinion, uh, go the opposite direction. So with you, with Kohler, it's like, my God, you're going to Whistling Straits. They're gonna host the Ryder Cup at some point. They're hosting major championships. You're working with a wonderful gentleman, Herb Kohler, uh, at the Kohler family. And, my gosh, what could I say but congratulations, so uh, job well done. And that's how you always work for everyone, is just trying to create more opportunities and really looking out for PGA members. You talked about kind of the next wave of leaders that we have in here, and you've been involved in golf for so many years. I mean, just give kind of your little bit of insight and, and maybe recommendation uh, on, the, on the next generation of professionals and what they can do to help the association. Yes, uh, we had a, a breakout sessions yesterday. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it with all three of them that I was involved with. And uh, we talked about that exact topic and didn't exactly come to conclusions other than um, the golf industry is changing. You know, everything, employment, how we operate golf courses, how we afford uh, uh, the, the, the costs of golf courses. We're, we're trying to figure that out. But I think it's gonna take, quite frankly, 
I've always believed windows of opportunity open and they close. And uh, I just feel as if we need uh, a, a new cycle of young professionals to show us what the new golf uh, uh, model will look like, golf operations model will look like. Uh, because I don't think you can re rely on me or others that have seen it one way for you know a, a certain style and methodology for so many years. And I just believe and, and trust that the new, next generation of head professionals will do the appropriate things and golf will flourish. It's too great, too great of a game not to. It's too great of a game not to. So I implore all of you, implore all you young professionals to get out there, in, create innovative opportunities, and uh, through both sides, the revenue and the expense side, figure it out, and I can't wait to see the results. So. So Brian, I know the conversation that we've had over the years always talks about the member, but we talk about our love for family as well, too. And any, anything you want to express to oh my gosh, yeah. the family at this point? Uh, yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, you know, there's an old saying that uh, if you ever see a turtle on top of a fence post, you can assume it didn't get there by itself. And, uh, yeah, and uh, I wouldn't have gotten here by myself. Uh, my wife, Stephanie, uh, my daughter, Megan, Ryan, uh, Jamie, my son-in-law, uh, Kaylee, our entire family, uh, Brinley, who I might see in a few minutes, uh, uh, little Brin, uh, is just a godsend for me. And uh, like everybody, I have my challenges. Try doing it alone. Try doing it alone. And I'm blessed that I don't have to do it alone.